So uh, first of all, uh, let me outline um, the plan for today's talk. Uh, so first of all, uh, I'll make some introductions um, and uh, then um, I will try to uh, look at the problem of the software requirement specifications, what uh, they are and who they are for. Um, uh, then uh, I will uh, outline a couple of types, different types of ambiguity uh, that are typical for software uh, requirement specifications. Um, uh, another uh, thing that I would like to cover is uh, a distinction uh, between manual and automated um, ambiguity detection um, uh, when it uh, is happening on different linguistic levels. Uh, another, uh, yet another uh, distinction will be uh, covering a rule-based uh, versus uh, machine learning-based automated uh, ambiguity detection. Uh, and um, like some final uh, thoughts uh, will be connected with uh, whether uh, ambiguity is the only type of imperfections uh, in software requirements. Um, and uh, I will share some references as well. So uh, before uh, I get uh, to um, the main uh, presentation, uh, I would like to um, to share my background. Uh, I started my uh, career in the field of general and applied linguistics uh, at uh, at the Sarat of uh, State University. Uh, it happened over 15 years ago, and uh, my first steps there uh, were at the Laboratory of uh, Applied Linguistics, where I worked first as an engineer uh, of linguistic databases, and then uh, managed uh, scientific and educational projects. Uh, at the same time, I uh, was doing research uh, and got my degree in general linguistics, uh, while also uh, teaching computer linguistics at the same university. And um, for me, it turned out to be uh, turned out to impossible to leave academia once and for all. So I stopped teaching at the university uh, only after I moved uh, to the US in summer 2018. And uh, my career at ExactPro uh, started uh, a little earlier. Uh, it started four years ago when I decided to try myself in the area of software testing and uh, joined the company as a junior QA. And uh, since uh, my uh, transition uh, to the company, um, to the company entity here in the US, uh, I have been working in the fields of uh, business development uh, and research. And uh, I'm also very often involved in different educational initiatives, which are either organized or supported by Exact Pro. And this summer school is one of the examples uh, and it's a real inspiration for me to be part of it. Uh, speaking uh, about uh, the company, uh, I think that uh, you already heard uh, about Exact Pro. Uh, you uh, probably remember uh, hearing it uh, about it uh, on Monday um, when Iosif introduced the company and also my colleague uh, Maxim was uh, speaking yesterday. Uh, so I think you're pretty familiar uh, with the company. Um, just to remind you, uh, we are specializing in software testing. Uh, we provide uh, functional and uh, non-functional testing services for major financial market infrastructures, which are located uh, globally. Um, yeah, and uh, now let me move uh, to the main part uh, of my presentation. And uh, before we speak about uh, automated ambiguity detection in software specification, uh, I would like to start with a short discussion of the terminology. So uh, when we speak uh, about project documentation, uh, there are several types of documents that are used in software engineering practice. Uh, first, uh, there are uh, requirements, uh, like business requirements, or functional, non-functional requirements, which basically uh, describe what st stakeholders are looking to have as a result of a software engineering project. Uh, it's a document which is more oriented towards the future. Specifications are some kind of technical standard that grasp uh, the functionality and other important uh, properties of the software uh, as is, as they are today. Uh, in this lecture, however, I will use the term specification in um, more generic sense, uh, 
uh, and it is um, very similar to uh, one uh, which is um, located here on the slide. Um, uh, this is uh, a definition which is given in the IEEE standard on software requirement specifications. Um, I uh, probably would not argue that this definition is the best one, mm, specifically because uh, the term is uh, defined uh, by itself, right? Um, but uh, it is quite convenient uh, to use uh, because it covers uh, a pretty wide range of software engineering documentation, uh, which describe how things work. Um, a couple of words about uh, the standard itself. Uh, it is uh, pretty versatile and uh, I like the way uh, that it presents the information. It basically uh, contains uh, a very good um, practi uh, like practical advice and uh, uh, a very good um, standard. Um, um, indeed, uh, which uh, can give you uh, an understanding of what is uh, the best way to structure uh, your requirement specification and, and why. Uh, the same standard outlines uh, the quality characteristics um, of a good uh, software requirement specifications, uh, namely uh, they are correctness, uh, un uh, un ambiguity, completeness, uh, consistency, ranking for importance and stability, verifiability, modifiability, and traceability. Mm, it, is, um, it is obvious that ambiguity and vagueness are something that we do not want in specs. Uh, fixing the con uh, consequences of misunderstandings um, that are created by uh, ambiguous documentation is very expensive especially after software implementation um, or when it is discovered, uh, for example, during the testing phase or even later. Uh, so uh, we do not want that. Uh, and uh, if you uh, can see from the diagram, uh, most defects are introduced during the uh, documentation uh, stage, um, somewhere in between uh, requirements, uh, specification and uh, software implementation. Uh, and at the same time, the cost uh, of fixing them at these stages uh, is the lowest. So that is why uh, it is uh, crucial to uncover hidden uh, defects uh, in software specifications uh, before they propagate onto the subsequent uh, phases, sub subsequent stages uh, of the project. But um, the uh, problem is, uh, and this is uh, generally the case, uh, that <laughs> Let me find this slide. Yeah. Um, the problem is that uh, most uh, requirement specifications and other documents uh, which describe software systems are written in natural language. And natural language is prone to ambiguity and imprecision. And the question is, why, uh, why suffer then? Uh, well, there is uh, actually no need to suffer if, uh, if we can uh, create a specification in a machine readable format using some formal language. Uh, but um, as uh, with many things in this world, uh, there is uh, always a certain trade off. Uh, of course, both approaches have their advantages and their disadvantages. And let, let's uh, look at them closer. So uh, while uh, natural language uh, docs are prone to ambiguity, imprecision, uncertainty, it is uh, actually easier, it is always easier to find a person who can uh, write uh, the document and um, natural language requirements are uh, really easier to understand by uh, stakeholders. And um, uh, another uh, very good quality of natural lang language is uh, that it is very universal. Uh, it does not uh, create additional limitations on the contents of the requirement specification, and uh, it does not impose uh, any like, picture of the world uh, uh, to the, uh, upon the person who uh, creates the requirements. And vice versa, uh, vice versa the, um, the requirements which are uh, highly formalized uh, with the means of uh, some formal language, by the means of some modeling language, um, uh, they are um, really free of ambiguity 
And uh, their drawback, their main drawback is that uh, they are not uh, easily understood by most stakeholders and it usually requires specialized knowledge uh, to create such requirements. And again, um, if uh, we use some formal language, it is, um, it is always a mental construct, uh, which basically means that uh, some, some person created the language and this language now imposes uh, some um, frame uh, for us to formulate the requirements. So it's, uh, it will be uh, limited and it will be a subjective in a sense that uh, the method methodology of uh, requirement specification uh, will be imposed on its author. Mm -hmm. So uh, it happens uh, that uh, natural language specifications are inevitable. Uh, they are remaining our stark uh, reality. Um, so um, and so does the problem of ambiguity. The phenomenon of ambiguity is studied by scholars in different fields. Uh, more theoretically, it is uh, studied in linguistics and philosophy. And uh, from a more practical point of view, of view I would say, uh, it, is, um, it is studied in uh, such fields as writing, law, and of course, requirements engineering. And speaking of this uh, particular field, uh, I wanted to mention that um, there is a specific conference, an annual event uh, that covers this uh, particular uh, knowledge domain. Um, this conference uh, is specifically uh, organized to, uh, to become a forum for discussion of uh, different problems in software specifications. And uh, many, many works um, which were published uh, in this conference proceedings uh, deal with ambiguity detection. Uh, by the way, this uh, conference has a separate website uh, which contains like several uh, references to best uh, papers which were uh, presented in different years of this con conference. So this is really uh, a very important uh, research hub on the topic. So if you are interested in the topic, please use it. Okay, uh, so uh, let's uh, move uh, again uh, to the uh, topic of today's discussion and uh, let's uh, define, let's try to define uh, the term itself. Uh, and uh, when we try to define uh, ambiguity, turns out that the term itself is ambiguous. Uh, so, uh, what is uh, ambiguity? Uh, ambiguity uh, can be uh, defined, um, first of all, as a statement that has more than one interpretation. Uh, at the same time, uh, if we look at the IEEE standard, we will see the following statement there, uh, that uh, an, uh, a software requirement specification will be unambigu uh, unambiguous if and only if uh, every requirement st uh, stated therein has only one interpretation, which effectively means that um, every statement that has more than one or less than one interpretation is ambiguous. Um, what can be the problem here? Um, it's uh, the um, scope of the term. And for example, there are vague or uh, incomplete statements that uh, may not have uh, like any valid uh, interpretation at all. Uh, but according to this definition, such statements should be considered uh, ambiguous because just because they are not unambiguous. So um, if we uh, take a look at different uh, research uh, on the topic, uh, we will see that uh, the scholars uh, identify uh, several types of ambiguity. First of all, uh, they um, distinguish language ambiguities and conceptual amb ambiguities. Language amb ambiguities are the types of ambiguities uh, that can be spotted uh, by anyone, by any reader who just has uh, an ear for language. And uh, conceptual uh, ambiguities, uh, they are really, mm, they're really dependent on the demand, uh, domain that is involved in software 
requirement specifications and uh, this uh, type of ambiguity can only be spotted by readers uh, that have uh, sufficient domain knowledge. Uh, for example, um, ambiguities in uh, the dom domain of uh, software engineering. Um, conceptual ambiguities um, cannot uh, directly uh, cannot be uh, directly observed in the text. So uh, maybe this is the reason why uh, language ambiguities uh, are the topic that uh, most research works are focused on. Uh, not uh, all uh, ambiguities uh, cause inconsistencies, not all ambiguities uh, cause misunderstanding. Uh, so not uh, ambiguities are really dangerous. So that's why um, a second uh, uh, distinction is between uh, innocuous and innocuous uh, ambiguities. So innocuous amb uh, ambiguities um, uh, are the ones uh, that uh, in a particular context uh, have uh, just, just one uh, obvious interpretation, but uh, there is some uh, other reading, but everyone uh, understands what is meant uh, from the situation. Um, but uh, Another type of ambiguities uh, that threaten the uh, outcome of the project, um, they are considered innocuous. Mm. So uh, innocuous uh, ambiguities uh, can be acknowledged, uh, which means that uh, readers recognize that they are present in the text, and uh, there are ambiguities that go undetected, and uh, those are called unacknowledged ambiguities. And um, I think this is uh, either easy to guess that this type uh, is especially dangerous uh, as uh, this is the one that is propagated into future stages of the system development process. So uh, when it comes to language ambiguity, uh, there are also uh, several types. Uh, and uh, yet again, um, here we have problem that there is no single accepted taxonomy here. So uh, as you can see, the field is, um, though it, it is quite uh, densely researched, um, there is uh, no common point of view, uh, which is shared by uh, all the scholars. So uh, some researchers such as Daniel Berry, uh, for example, uh, who is, uh, by the way, uh, main uh, organizer of the requirements engineering conference uh, and who was uh, cited on one of the previous uh, slides. Um, so he shares uh, an opinion, he and his colleagues share an opinion uh, that uh, there are four types of linguistic ambiguity and uh, there are the types associated with different language level levels, um, starting from lexical level, uh, then going up to syntactic one, then uh, going up to semantics and uh, finally to pragmatics. Um, also, uh, this, um, this group of authors uh, recognize that uh, ambiguity has uh, a re related, like uh, a, ph a phenomenon which is uh, closely related to it. And these uh, phenomena are called generality and vagueness. So uh, they are uh, pretty similar to ambiguity because they, um, they mess with the uh, outcome, they mess with the understanding of the requirement. Uh, but, um, so this is uh, the commonality, but uh, they uh, also recognize that uh, this uh, phenomenon is quite different. Hmm. So this is one uh, point of view. And there is also another point of view, uh, which is shared by Mm, the scholars from uh, Georgia um, Tech, uh, Technical University, G Georgia Institute uh, of Technology. Uh, and uh, these uh, scholars, um, they think that the uh, pointer. So uh, they think uh, that uh, there are six types of ambiguity, and uh, they uh, include into the notion of language ambiguity also such types as, as vagueness and incompleteness, while uh, all the four, uh, all the uh, rest are uh, the types which are tra traditionally considered as uh, language ambiguity. Um, 
So uh, maybe to um, give you a flavor uh, of, uh, of the complexity of the task, uh, let's uh, take a look at those examples which are uh, presented on this slide. Uh, so um, the authors uh, give us uh, the examples on each uh, and every level of the ambiguity, for example, lexical uh, ambiguity, as you can see uh, from the sentence, uh, Melissa walked to the bank. Uh, it is represented by the word bank, uh, which uh, can, um, can mean either um, the bank of the river or the financial institution. Uh, another type uh, is on the following level. It is a syntactic um, ambiguity, and uh, it is represented uh, by the example, quickly read and discuss this tutorial. So uh, where is the ambiguity? It is, um, it is in the word quickly, whether, it's mod mod whether it modifies uh, only the verb read or um, whether it modifies uh, both uh, verbs read and discuss. Uh, next level and uh, next type is semantic ambiguity. Uh, here we have uh, like more uh, situational meaning, uh, like Fred and Ethel are married. So uh, what is what is the truth? We can tell our husband and wife or whether they just have um, spouses of their own. Uh, Fred is tall. Fred is tall is uh, a very vague uh, construction, very vague sentence, because uh, in different cultures, uh, different uh, people have different thoughts of what they consider tall, what they consider short. So this is not uh, specified directly in the sentence. Uh, a, a similar situation we can see in uh, um, the example which is given by incompleteness. Here we also lack some information. Uh, we have a recipe, but uh, the recipe does not uh, specify the amount of the food that should be used uh, to cook some dish. Uh, and the uh, last uh, type of ambiguity on this uh, slide is um, yet uh, again language ambiguity. Uh, and this is the uh, type which is um, which is called sometimes called, uh, called referential um, ambiguity, but uh, actually it is a subtype of uh, more broad, more generic type, uh, which is called pragmatical uh, ambiguity. So the example says that uh, the boy told his father about the damage. He was very upset. So we do not know who was really upset. Uh, either the boy who was afraid of uh, his father's reaction or the father who wasn't happy about uh, the damage. And a similar mm, example is uh, shown on the picture, uh, one of the pictures below. Um, funny example uh, about the puppy and the doctor. So we do not, uh, we, we are not sure, we cannot be sure who just loves to give big, wet, sloppy kisses, whether it's the puppy or the doctor. Uh, so um, let's uh, move further uh, to uh, look closer at the task of the ambiguity detection. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, ambiguity in uh, documentation is a very serious problem. So people um, strive to, to resolve it in, in the best possible ways. Uh, it can be done manually and it can be done uh, using automation. And uh, due to the nature of ambiguity um, defects, uh, which stem from um, like natural language specificity, uh, both ways are actually not easy. And uh, I also think that you understood uh, this from examples that I uh, gave on the pre previous slides. So, um, you know, we have uh, a couple of uh, types here. Uh, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, each and every one uh, of those. So first of all, uh, manual ambiguity detection. Uh, there is a set of techniques and uh, those techniques um, are known under a common name of uh, inspection. And um, under this uh, big and wide type, um, 
scholars differentiate different uh, sub-techniques such as checklists, modeling, and a scenario-based reading. Um, all, all the types uh, were uh, proposed by Kamstis uh, and uh, his co-authors in 2001. And uh, as far as I remember, that was the topic of uh, his uh, thesis. Um, so what, uh, what these techniques are? Checklists uh, are based uh, on some lists of words which are commonly um, met uh, in different requirements. So if we uh, read lots of requirements, we can um, um, we can uh, gather like a dictionary, a big list that we can use in subsequent uh, requirement analysis. Uh, another approach is um, built around modeling. Uh, which is uh, basically meant that uh, we try to apply um, some formal model, some formal language uh, to uh, the natural language uh, specification. And while we translate uh, natural language statements into the formal language, uh, we um, can't do without this ambiguation. So we will spot uh, the ambiguities anyway. And the third uh, approach here for the manual um, ambiguity detection is called scenario-based reading. And uh, this technique uh, is uh, very close actually to uh, software testing because uh, when we uh, try to create uh, software testing scenarios based on the requirements, specifications, uh, we usually uh, analyze the requirement and we ask ourselves, whether this requirement is good enough, uh, whether the information is enough uh, that we could uh, do uh, like a proper um, software testing uh, scenario uh, based on this um, requirement. Yeah, and uh, another uh, type of um, approach uh, to ambi uh, ambiguity detection is um, uh, an automated one uh, here. You can see that uh, there are two subtypes. Uh, first is one, uh, a rule-based, and uh, the second is uh, artificial intelligence base. Um, of course, uh, um, it, so uh, it uh, it does not necessarily mean uh, that uh, one of the approaches is better than another. So one may think that uh, the more uh, sophisticated uh, technique uh, we are using, the more effective it is. But this is not the case with the uh, natural language requirements because um, this human input is very important. This is uh, one thing. And uh, another thought is that uh, all the automated methods are usually mm, missing some some information, they uh, miss some examples, and this is something that uh, we do not have uh, when we are dealing with uh, defects of any kind. So, let me go on another slide. Apologies for that. Yeah, um, uh, there are certain uh, challenges uh, that are associated with uh, manual ambiguity, um, and uh, when, but with, I'm sorry, with uh, manual amb ambiguity detection. Um, and um, this slide demonstrates the list. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, you can uh, already get a basic understanding of the complexity of the ambiguity detection tasks, uh, even if we are doing it manually. So uh, what is the problem here? Um, first of all, uh, we are very strongly dependent on the readers having um, his natural ability to um, spot the uh, ambiguities in requirements. Uh, second thought is that uh, we are dependent on whether our reader is competent enough, whether he uh, has a very good uh, understanding of the knowledge domain uh, in which the requirement specification is created. Um, and uh, when we uh, talk about manual ambiguity detection, it's always subject to subjectivity. Um, another thing is that uh, some ambiguities uh, can 
be introduced uh, into the requirement text uh, intentionally. For example, some people do it uh, just to avoid uh, of updating um, specifications over and over again when uh, some minor changes are introduced. And uh, of course, um, analyzing the requirements manually, it's a very uh, hard and time consuming uh, job. So this is also one of the challenges. This is one of the disadvantages of the approach. Um, but uh, on the other hand, uh, when we uh, move uh, to the automation and uh, apply some automa uh, automated techniques uh, to the task of ambiguity detection, uh, it definitely helps to reduce human effort. Another good thing that uh, it helps with uh, its uh, uh, reduces uh, subjectivity, but uh, again, uh, not completely, uh, but to a certain degree, um, as I mentioned, uh, if we have, if we deal with a formalization of any kind, it's always some uh, imposed po point of view. So that's why uh, I'm you know, putting here that we um, were talking about reducing subjectivity to a certain degree. So there is always um, subjectivity of methodology. And uh, um, what else, what uh, another problem uh, is uh, resolved by the automated ambigu ambiguity detection is that uh, it uh, does not miss um, the unacknowledged ambiguity, which uh, can um, easily be missed by the human. Um, as I mentioned on one of the previous slides, uh, there are uh, two basic types of automated uh, ambiguity detection. First of the approaches uh, that I uh, would like to cover uh, today is rule-based, uh, a rule-based approach. Uh, the thing with the rule-based uh, approaches um, um, in automated uh, ambiguity detection is that uh, they are uh, very reliant on the approaches uh, that are used uh, during the manual uh, ambiguity detection phase. So that, that was the reason that I uh, looked uh, at ambiguity detection, uh, at manual ambiguity detection in so much detail. That's why I gave uh, the examples. Um, and uh, the thing is that uh, having uh, the information on uh, some uh, words, some typical words uh, which are prone to ambiguity, um, having the information on some maybe typical patterns, um, uh, we can um, go ahead and uh, create some um, automation. Uh, for example, we can search uh, for an exact phrase, so we can build a dictionary of um, uh, potentially dangerous words. Uh, we can use a uh, tokenizer, we can use uh, POS uh, Part of speech tagger, and uh, we can uh, search for particular tags. Uh, those two approaches and uh, search uh, for uh, certain patterns which are combining um, part of speech, uh, words of uh, different part of, uh, parts of speech, uh, so having some grammatical tags, uh, and we have uh, we can um, combine this with uh, exact words exact phrases. Um, more advanced techniques uh, that is so shown on this slide uh, deals with uh, using different uh, heuristics uh, about the words in text of um, specifications. For example, we can use, we can add to the search um, of exact phrases and uh, search uh, by regular exp expressions uh, we can enhance them uh, by the uh, collocation frequencies. We can um, enhance it by uh, such metrics as distributional similarity or semantic similarity, uh, etc. And of course, uh, we can combine everything and uh, build a very comprehensive uh, automated tool. Uh, before I move to the examples uh, of actual research, which uh, looks at those methods, uh, let me mm, get back to the task of uh, manual uh, ambiguity detection and uh, like uh, try, uh, try to extrapolate uh, how it can be used uh, for uh, automated uh, ambiguity detection. 
For example, um, if we look at the handbook uh, written uh, by Barry on manual ambiguity detection, he, um, he, de he is definitely talking about a person analyzing uh, word by word, analyzing the requirement specification and looking for potentially dangerous, potentially ambiguous words and phrases. So uh, the uh, example of such words is presented in his uh, handbook. And if we look uh, at the words and constructions that he gives as an example, we can see that uh, they can be used uh, either as exact phrases uh, for uh, automated ambiguity de detection. Uh, for example, uh, this is those that are shown uh, on the slide. I think that they are self-explanatory. Um, a little, a little bit more uh, of those um, uh, which are dealing with quantification, like each and every, only, also, uh, a, the, many, few. So some functional, very, very um, frequent uh, words. Um, then we can um, take a look at another language, um, another le level of which deals with patterns. So these examples, uh, they are not um, about uh, particular words, but they rather focus on um, word patterns, some collocations, some uh, typical language uh, sequences that uh, can be ambiguous. So um, we can see that we can uh, apply uh, manual, uh, something that we uh, learned uh, on the uh, stage of manual ambiguity detection, we can use it for uh, automated rule-based ambiguity detection as well. Uh, one of the example is um, shown on the slide. Uh, there is uh, a research which, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, covering um, using um, natural language processing technique to detect requirements defects. Uh, as a, um, as a source uh, for this research, the authors uh, have taken requirement specification from the railway domain, but this is not so important because uh, what they use can be um, can be reused in any other uh, knowledge domain. Uh, so uh, what they do, uh, they uh, do uh, pre-processing of the text. Uh, they um, they tag each and every word uh, as a certain part of speech, and they uh, come up with the regular expressions which uh, describe some um, ambiguous patterns. Uh, they have taken the patterns uh, using the uh, handbook that uh, I uh, also already mentioned, the handbook by uh, Daniel Berry. Uh, and uh, based on this uh, book, they uh, picked several uh, typical patterns and they uh, came up with the uh, formal language descriptions. So they uh, came up with uh, some uh, regular expressions. Mm, let's uh, take a look on some of them. Uh, for example, uh, if we uh, look at coordination ambiguity, this is the one uh, which deals with and and or, which uh, can be used uh, for two or more times in one sentence. For example, uh, I met uh, Paul and Mary and John, which means that I met Paul and then I met Mary and John. Or uh, it can mean uh, I uh, met Paul and Mary and John. So Paul and Mary were together and John uh, was met like separately. So this uh, uh, PCO2 um, example uh, is describing, um, I'm sorry, uh, well, um, PCO1 um, pattern uh, describes this situation. And uh, this pattern uh, describes uh, another type of coordination ambiguity. Again, uh, we have uh, and and or uh, as a potentially dangerous place. Uh, but here we have uh, an adjective uh, which modifies uh, some noun, and we have uh, another noun uh, which uh, follows uh, the uh, conjunction uh, and on uh, or or. For example, hmm, a good example of uh, this would be hmm, 
let me come up with something. Um, for example, structured uh, approaches and platforms. So whether um, whether structured are only approaches or both approaches and platforms are structured. So I think that you uh, got the idea how it works. So uh, there are different regular expressions which uh, can help to identify um, potentially ambiguous patterns. Uh, another um, interesting research uh, in the domain of rule-based ambiguity detection is uh, a very extensive uh, and multi-step research um, to ambiguity detection, and it actually uses several rule-based techniques. First, uh, first of all, the text corpus was uh, prepared and processed with POS tagger, part of speech tagger, uh, and uh, then uh, the needed patterns were identified. Um, and a very interesting approach um, that the, they uh, have taken just two of those. Uh, so they, um, their approach is very, very thorough. So uh, rather than uh, take all the types of ambiguity and try and do something with them, uh, they, um, they narrowed down to just two types. Um, both of them, I think, uh, are uh, already known to us. Uh, those uh, are the the ambiguity which is introduced by the conjunction and or or. And uh, another one uh, is a uh, verb uh, or noun attachment ambiguity, uh, which deals with um, some element which modifies either uh, one word or uh, a couple of them. Yeah. So, uh, uh, what they did, uh, they uh, pre-processed the text, uh, they uh, identified the patterns, they, uh, they have taken just two of them. Uh, another very interesting step that they um, have taken uh, in this research is that uh, they analyzed their text, uh, the requirements uh, text that we, they were pre-processing uh, from the point of view of uh, their um, knowledge domain. Uh, they have taken the keywords from this knowledge domain, and based on those keywords, they uh, generated um, domain-specific corpora. Uh, and uh, the task was to uh, evaluate uh, ambiguity detection technique on this uh, corpora, which was um, built uh, using uh, like the uh, existing corpora as a source. Uh, the next step uh, was uh, that they used some uh, statistics uh, on um, words collocation, on um, uh, their distribution properties, and so on and so forth. And uh, after they uh, did it, uh, they um, they evaluated the new texts, uh, the, the new requirement texts, as either ambiguous or unambiguous. So uh, basically, uh, they uh, applied both. Uh, both rule-based uh, techniques uh, that I identified earlier. And uh, finally, the last uh, type of ambiguity, uh, when we talk about uh, ambiguity, automated ambiguity detection, uh, I already mentioned that it is a very complex task. Uh, and the problem with the rule-based ambiguity is that uh, it uh, deals with uh, only the part patterns which are uh, like directly seen, which can be easily identified and which deal with uh, the lowest uh, linguistic levels, such as uh, lexical and uh, syntactical. And uh, if we want to resolve uh, ambiguity on higher levels, such as semantics, pragmatics, uh, it is not enough uh, to use just rule-based uh, approach. And uh, machine learning approaches uh, are more sophisticated, they are more advanced, and that's why they can tackle uh, higher linguistic levels. Uh, the examples of approaches that can be used for such a task uh, are uh, vector representation using SVMs. Um, they uh, also very often involve uh, domain-specific corpora. And um, another um, example is uh, a Bayesian uh, algorithm, uh, Bayesian um, uh, bias, uh, net network. 
falsification algorithm. And uh, the uh, last one, which I put on this slide, uh, deals with the decision tree uh, based uh, text classifier. Uh, I do not uh, think that um, like more uh, elabor uh, elaborate examples are needed here because each of those methods uh, is a separate topic in another knowledge domain. Uh, let me just uh, limit myself to uh, the last uh, example that I will give um, as part of this lecture. So um, uh, this is uh, a research uh, which uh, deals with uh, detecting domain-specific ambiguities. And um, this uh, research uh, used uh, requirement specification uh, in this different knowledge domains, and uh, their main goal was uh, to identify the words which uh, which can be unambigu uh, which can be ambiguous uh, because uh, they are used in different uh, knowledge domains in different meanings. Uh, when they uh, built uh, ve vector representations of such words, um, uh, what what does it mean uh, the vector representation of words? Um, let me explain it um, in more detail. So uh, when they um, uh, build a vector representation uh, of a word, it means that uh, they uh, represent uh, some text uh, as a vector space, and uh, they build um, a vector um, for each word. Uh, and then uh, our word will have uh, some numeric value. If we uh, take two words, we can... Um, uh, treat them as vectors, and we can uh, calculate uh, the distance between uh, those vectors, and uh, we can identify uh, whether those uh, words are similar to each other or whether they are completely different and they cannot be used together, they cannot mean um, like similar things. Um, so um, when they built uh, those uh, vector representations, for the same uh, words, but in different uh, knowledge domains, in requirements in different knowledge domains, uh, they um, were able to rank the, those words uh, according to um, their like similarity, similarity uh, ranking. So, um, what, what, uh, how, how we can um, interpret the table that you can see on the slide? Um, so. For example, if we look, just one second, if we look at the first um, uh, string uh, on the very last uh, uh, column, uh, we can see the word code. Uh, and uh, this is not uh, a co coincidence. Um, uh, the thing is that uh, the word code uh, is uh, understood differently in computer science domain uh, as if compared to, for example, medical domain, uh, when code uh, is um, uh, when, uh, where code means more uh, something uh, connected with the way uh, of um, people, uh, how people should behave. Uh, another uh, good example is programming. It's uh, uh, identified as different words uh, for, for example, electronic engineering and in sports. And vice versa, if we look at the bottom of this table, we can see such words as link, or language or application. And um, I think that this is uh, uh, quite intu uh, intuitive that uh, those words are, uh, have pretty similar uh, meanings in different um, knowledge domains, which means uh, that those words are not so dangerous from the point of view of uh, ambiguity. And uh, I, I would like to uh, tell that it is all, but uh, actually the, the very last thing that I wanted to mention that ambiguity is not the only problem, not the only defect that uh, can be found in the natural language um, specifications. Um, so uh, there are other problems and uh, many scholars have looked uh, and tried to identify uh, the problems. Uh, so what, uh, what makes uh, the texts uh, um, not easy to read, not uh, easy to understand, what uh, makes us make uh, mistakes uh, in uh, our understanding? 
So uh, it turns out that um, there are techniques, uh, there are uh, certain approaches to estimate uh, difficulty and complexity of the task. So uh, assess it from the point of view of uh, its readability. And uh, there are certain metrics which uh, were uh, developed by the scholars, and those involve, uh, for example, uh, phrases uh, and words length, uh, phrase structures, um, number of rare words that are used in the text, number of um, like uh, indirect com uh, different uh, indirect uh, word sequences, uh, like uh, idioms, metaphors, metonyms. Uh, and uh, they also use uh, some read readability indices, and like there are more than 10 of those as well. So uh, turns out that those pr uh, problems are quite uh, identifiable and they are quite uh, quantifiable as well. Uh, I tried and uh, put together uh, some of the references uh, which I used for um, this uh, presentation, but the list is not complete. So there are, uh, of course, uh, many, many more. Uh, I would say that uh, I picked just one example uh, of uh, so I given a source for each uh, problem or each type. Uh, so please take a look at this. Uh, and uh, maybe the last thing that uh, I would like to say is that if you are uh, interested in the uh, problem of software testing, if you are interested in the problem uh, of uh, uh, defects uh, that can be uh, found on different stages of software de development life cycle, not only in uh, requirements, but uh, throughout all the cycle, uh, I would like to uh, uh, invite you to a very interesting um, meetup that we are uh, going to have in August. Uh, Kari Kakanin will be presenting uh, his uh, recently published book, uh, which is called Dragons Out. What is very uh, special about this book uh, is that it is uh, the very first uh, one which uh, tries uh, to share the idea of good software testing practice with the kids. So this is something uh, new. Uh, so he, uh, he thinks that we should start uh, not only from requirement specification in software development lifecycle, but also with kids when we uh, try and explain to people the importance uh, of uh, identifying different defects uh, in software engineering. So this is uh, all from my side.